Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. And as people uh, join us, we'll let them join us. Um, welcome to our July program of the Historic Foodway Society of the Delaware Valley. I am Dan Macy, the president of the nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion and understanding of food history for over 25 years. If you're not familiar with our group, because I do know that we have a number of non-members with us today too. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know about programs that are coming up. Uh, the next program is on August 21st, um, where it will be a historic foodways bazaar and potluck. It will be outside and it is live at the Bowman uh, Wildflower Preserve near New Hope, Pennsylvania. Um, please bring your potted, your pickled, your preserved, your baked goods, your dried herbs, your kitchen equipment, and we will have a sort of a bazaar. And then we'd ask everybody to bring a potluck um, uh, dish to share with uh, people that are there. So please let me know, RSVP at dan at historicfoodways.org so that I know who's coming and what to expect uh, and uh, that we don't have uh, 10 jello salads. Well, that would sound delicious to me though. Um, and then after that, on September 16th, um, we are going to have a pa pa powwow um, at Elwood Restaurant with uh, Philadelphia chef Adam Dilt. Will share with us his pa pa story and some of his great recipes using this fruit that is very native uh, to the region that we uh, most of us are in around Philadelphia. Um, and then in October, we are all going to plan and participate in the Newland Gristmill Park Harvest Festival. Um, and we are looking for some volunteers. We're not exactly sure what we're going to do yet, but we're going to do some sort of historic food, either a demonstration or cook or something like that. And uh, that will be October 1st. Um, and then uh, I have added a one last program to our year, which will also be our short annual meeting, but it is the Smiling Nut, Cracking the Story and Cuisine of the Pistachio with our friend, Chef Aliza Green. Um, and it will be at the Venetian Club in Chestnut Hill section of Philadelphia. Um, if anybody's familiar with pistachios, um, I luckily just came back from Sicily with Aliza where we enjoyed quite a lot of pistachio dishes. And that sort of inspired us to do this program where we realized we didn't quite know as much about pistachios as we thought we did. So we're going, uh, Lisa is going to share all of her knowledge and some uh, tasting dishes, uh, including I'm making uh, for some pistachio ice cream. So I look forward to everybody seeing, seeing everybody at these programs and please uh, let us know if you are going to attend. All of this is listed on the website, uh, historicfoodways.org. And for those people who are not members on this call, if you would like to join and become a member for $20, um, if you join now, this would be good for all of 2023. So basically you're getting a year and a half membership at our membership sale today and today only. Um, one of the last point before we get started is also we are going to elect new officers, a president, vice president and secretary at the end of the year. Um, if you would like to get more involved with our organization, and would like to learn more, please contact myself or one of the other board members, and we will have uh, nominating people uh, within the next month. And if you are interested, you may nominate yourself or someone else for any of these positions. So I hope that uh, people will get more involved that way as well. Please keep your computer on mute, and you are free to ask questions throughout the presentation through the chat, which we will ask, and then also at the end, if anybody would like to personally uh, talk, uh, we will do that as well. Now on to the meat of the program. Um, it is my great honor to introduce Ruth Goodman as our speaker today. She epitomizes the concept of learning through doing. And like many of us on this call have tried to teach about, the cons uh, about domestic history through cooking at historic sites. She has immersed herself in living the way our foremothers did and allowed it all to be filmed for us to learn from on television. She is considered what the English call a television presenter, but we in the States call a TV host. But she is more than that. She has authored numerous books on English domestic history, including How to Be a Victorian, 
Her latest book, The Domestic Revolution, How the Introduction of Coal into Victorian Homes Changed Everything, is what she is here to talk to us today about. And stealing a line from her book jacket, in tracing the shift from wood to coal-fired homes, she reveals a pattern of innovation as the woman stoking these fires also stoked new global industries from better soap to new ingredients and methods of cooking. It is my great pleasure to introduce Ruth Goodman. Hi, Ruth. Oh, thank you. That was very kind of you. <laughs> nice to meet you all. And thank you very much for letting me talk about one of my favorite subjects, food and fuel. I think a lot of people talk about ingredients and regionality as being uh, very important. But I have always wondered if maybe fuel isn't the forgotten ingredient, the thing that 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 sets out what you can do, how you do it, your methodology, what, what works best in your area. And it's not just about what grows there, but also how you cook it, the methods. Um, and for me, this book grew out of an enormous amount of personal experience. As you say, I've been doing the historic thing for a long time now. Um, and for most of that time, I worked with wood. I was working mostly on uh, 16th and 17th century British uh, history and that I thought meant wood <laughs> mostly wood a little bit of peat a little bit occasionally of sheep dung some thistles some brambles some <laughs> a whole host of plants biofuels basically and then one day I had to start doing a program for the Victorian and I had to switch over to using coal and boy was that a shock to the system absolutely everything had to be done different the more I did the more different I realized it was and I realised that it, it, it sort of wasn't much researched and wasn't much talked about. This shift from being a wood-fired nation to being a coal-fired nation that happens first in Britain and then spreads out across the globe is something that is remarkably unrecorded. And I think that's because it was happening in the home. It's being led by women. And even more than that, it's being led by working class women, not the ladies, not the head of the household, but by the women who are actually doing the work in the kitchens, who may be either a working class family in their own homes, or it's working class servants working in the homes of the middle and upper classes. It, this is a revolution of ordinary women. There are men involved, obviously. <laughs> The world has never been completely separate. The idea of genders being utterly fixed and there being things only for men and only for women is a fiction and always has been. However, it is nonetheless primarily a story about working class women. And the thing that I first have to tell you is just how early it begins. London is the first place in the Western world to move over from wood to coal. And it does it between 1570 and 1600, before the Pilgrim Fathers even leave our shores and head over your side of the Atlantic, already London is switching. It takes about that 30 years. It's not a very long period. It's basically one generation. Those people, that little bunch of people, and of course it wasn't that many people at that time. London was growing fast, but even so, we're talking about a couple of hundred thousand people. But that shift has changed food, it has changed cooking methods, it has changed hygiene, it has changed an enormous amount of what we think of as the domestic world, as it gradually, well not even that gradually, as it rapidly spread out, first from the capital into the rest of the Britain, and then after quite some pause, to the rest of the world. The story of coal as a fuel is an ancient one within the British shores. For 400 years, Coal was the main fuel of London, and for 200 years, it was the main fuel of the whole of Britain. The rest of the world have to wait until the 19th century, and that includes America. If we think about it, coal within the US is something that comes in the 19th century, and it really only comes to the cities in the US. America remains a wood-fired nation in its rural regions, coal-fired in the cities. And that's, of course, because the network of, of supply was never quite so dense on such an enormous scale. Britain is tiny. 
It's a very small nation and we industrialized early and we put in our railways very early, the first obviously. And we put in an incredibly dense network a network that nowadays is still the densest in the world, but that's why after it's been slashed back, there were three times as many stations in 1880 as there are now within Britain, and we've still got more than anyone else. So you have to think of this extremely dense coverage right over the British nation that can move coal. So for the last period, the last 150 years of coal use in Britain, everybody could get it. And that is not the story in America, where the railway lines were busy moving coal between cities, but not out into the more rural regions. So the experience in America is very different from that within Britain. And I, and I have to keep bringing that up right at the beginning, because it's important that you should be aware of this, that we are talking about something that is partly a shared experience, but partly not. So what happens? Well, the reason that coal takes over in London is that London just grew too fast. Um, everywhere in Britain obviously was expanding in that era. It was a time in which certain diseases were falling away. The, the dangerousness of the plague and the sweating sickness was coming down. Just like this pandemic we've seen recently, it begins as a real killer and then gradually evolves into something that is much less dangerous. Now, the Black Death took centuries for that process. There were no vaccines. It took centuries for that process to happen, but it was happening. And with less people dying, that means the population was growing. However, although all of Britain's population was growing and indeed all of Europe's population was growing, London was growing particularly fast. And to be honest, nobody knows why. It is a mystery. It was growing at an incredible rate within the years of Elizabeth's reign the population quadrupled and fuel could not keep up. Food could. We managed to keep feeding people, moving food into the capital to keep pace with this explosion of population, but not the fuel. We just couldn't shift enough wood fast enough from far enough away. And so we turned to an alternative source, one that we'd always turned our noses up at because it's foul stuff, coal. I don't know if you've ever actually had to have it in your home. A lot of people talk with enormous nostalgia about coal. And I think that's because what they're remembering is their childhood, when their mum or their gran was the person chained to the stove. They just had this lovely warm experience as kids in which mum was always there waiting on them, or lovely warm with food, etc. They were not the ones dealing with the filth. They were not the ones doing the work. So I think we get a rather skewed sort of vision of uh, coal fires um, from, from the sort of like oral memory. And we have to sort of like hang on to that thought. Coal is a difficult fuel to burn. If you, if you make a pile of wood on the floor and set light to it, it burns fine, you can cook and it's not a problem. If you set a pile of peat on the floor and set light to it, yeah, okay, you can cook on it, it's fine. You try doing that with a pile of coal, you're gonna be in trouble. It's just not gonna burn. In order to make it burn, you've gotta raise it up off the ground. You've gotta put it in some sort of iron grate and you've gotta make sure it's got a really thorough draw through it. You're not gonna be able to do it just in a heap. You're gonna need a chimney. So. This is something that requires technological investment. It requires a hearth, it requires ironwork, it requires setting up in a permanent way. It's much harder to manage. And then of course it tastes disgusting. Wood smoke tastes lovely, so does peat smoke. I mean, we still introduce these flavors into our foods deliberately, don't we? We have oak smoked this and peat smoked that, you know, they're, they're common flavors, they're enjoyable and you can play with them. You can have the oak smoke or the apple wood smoke or, you know, they've all got a slight different sort of tang to them and they bring something positive to the eating experience. Not so coal. Coal just tastes disgusting. There is no way around it. It's sulfurous. I mean, who wants sulfur all over their food? So if you try and cook coal food directly open over a coal fire so that the smoke can touch it, you're going to have something that's horrible. So it's difficult, it's expensive to manage, and it tastes nasty. So the only reason people move over is because of necessity initially. Other things then come into play, fashion and goodness knows what else all comes into play, but that initial shift was because people had very little choice and when they did 
they had all sorts of problems that came with it. And if you have a go at this, you'll find it yourself. You try and do it with the really simple stuff with the recipes that people had before there was coal, and you'll see how difficult it is. Cooking in Britain and Europe in the wood-fired eras has a lot of what I might call rhythm of heat to it. There's a rise and a fall in the way that heat is used because that's what wood does, wood in particular, and wood was the, wood, the, the fuel of choice when people could choose. So think of risottos or paellas, that sort of idea that you might bring something up to heat and then put the lid on and let it just simmer gently in its own heat, perhaps with the heat, the fire even dying away underneath. That style of cooking, which is extremely economical on fuel, you don't need a huge amount, you just bring it up, put a lid on, let it go out again. Very easy to do over wood. Disaster on coal, it will burn. <laughs> you simply can't do that sort of cooking. It will stick on the bottom, it will burn. You will have wasted your precious ingredients. So that huge body of tradition that we used to have, had to go. And Britain did used to have that tradition. If you look into the medieval recipe books, you'll see that we had things called frumenties and pottages and, and mo moies. And there's a whole range of these sorts of thick, wet things that were cooked in that fashion, particularly, one suspects, at the bottom end of the social scale. It's all very well for the rich to, you know, have a huge amount of variety, but these sorts of dishes are real peasant food. They're very easy to cook. They don't take a lot of equipment. Um, you don't have to ha go to the expense of taking your grain to the miller to be milled. You can just use the whole grain at home without that additional expense. This was the basis of peasant food and suddenly it doesn't work anymore. Suddenly you've got coal and it just doesn't work. So what the heck do you do? And I find that really interesting. What works on coal is boiling. Now, I'm sure you've made any number of jokes yourselves in the past about traditional British food being mostly boiled. And uh, it's true. Traditionally, during the coal era, we boiled. And we boiled because that is what works best on coal. If you if you take something and you just put it in water and you can put it on a high heat, it doesn't matter how high, deep, high heat that is, it can keep going. It's not going to overcook. It's not going to catch. It's not going to burn. You can carry on doing the work of the household whilst it's getting on with it. So the whole idea of boiled food is a response to a practical need. And we have to learn a whole new set of dishes. If we've abandoned one whole half of our, our traditional cuisine, we have to sort of invent a new one that works with this boiling method. And it's very, very noticeable that many of the things that one thinks of as quintessentially British that do not have a European um, equivalency are within this boiling tradition. Things like the puddings, particularly. The very first um, boiled pudding that turns up in a bag, a cloth bag in which it's boiled in a big cauldron of water. The very first printed recipe for that is 1612, note the date. Remember what I said, the, the change over to coal was between 1570 and 1600. So within a decade of that change, we've got this new form of cooking arising. There's a couple of recipes in some handwritten manuscripts that predate it, but only by a few years. The earliest I've come across is 1603. So here we have a new form of cooking, a new form of recipe to go with this new form of fuel. It's not just the boiling either though. There's also the toasting. Now I know that in the US you're also rather keen on toast. It is one of the few things that we would say, I would say is very much shared, not at the sort of chefy end of our joint tradition, but at the very much the homely, practical, normal end of our shared part of our tradition, the joy of toast. Toast goes brilliantly as a method of cooking with coal. It's a bit tricky on wood. Coal, perfect. It's so easy. If you've got a coal fire and a coal grate, a little toasting fork, you hold it in front, salt it. I mean, honestly, it's, it's, it's nearly as easy and, and certainly as quick as using an electric toaster. It's a very simple procedure. 
if you try to do it with wood, it's very hard to get uh, an area of heat that is consistent enough and in the right place for the, for the bread to be against it. Um, you end up with things that are, you know, take ages, they sort of dry out rather than toasting, or they fall in the fire and get covered in ash. It's, it's a faff. And again, I suggest you try it. <laughs> Have a go at trying to toast. Whatever you do with a wood fire, uh, toasting isn't quite the thing. As soon as you've got a grate and with coal in, toasting is marvellous. And so a whole new set of toasting things arises. And we see that particularly in the 18th century, associated with people who were perhaps cooking for the first time. So not so much the main cook within a big household, for example, that's being done by a chef and, or a cook and all their assistants. But imagine somebody stuck in their lodgings, maybe a young lawyer, a bachelor, he could get the servants to come and cook him a meal, or he could do his own toasting, because it's very simple, in front of the little fire that's already in his room. And so we see a rise of, of like sort of informal toasting, of private toasting, of people who wouldn't necessarily normally be a cook, people like bachelors, students, um, lawyers, people like spinsters perhaps, who've just got lodgings of a couple of rooms within a, a larger house, um, people who are away for the season, traveling. So within Britain, that often meant places like Bath, where you would be going to take the waters. So you would, you know, perhaps not have your full establishment with you. People take to toasting and they want something more exciting to toast. So we get the development of new toasting foods, things like muffins and crumpets and pipelets. And there's a whole array of different baked goods ready for the toasting. So there's a big shift in many ways as to what sort of things are being cooked, who's cooking them, um, and a shift in, in sort of attitudes towards cooking as well. As to, well, there are styles of cooking. That, that suit different situations. There is both an informal tradition rising and a more formal tradition arising. And the two are sort of playing off against each other. This is partly hidden by the fact that the really posh, the really rich, never fully went over to coal. For them, there was another option and that allowed them to hang on to wider European traditions and to still buy into the tradition of um, French cooking in particular, and that is charcoal. If you are wealthy, that remained an option. You might have coal in your kitchen for some aspects of the cooking, but you'd also have a small charcoal range. And all the great chefs, all the ones with the posh names in all the grand houses, the hotels, the palaces, they always kept hold of their separate charcoal cooking range alongside the coal cooking and it allowed them to do continental foods. So that particularly within Britain, the tradition splits. We have a coal tradition that is being used by the middle and lower classes. And then we have this posh French chef tradition, which is being used by the upper classes and in hotels. And they're hanging on to this sort of French continental style of cooking and largely ignoring this bigger mass of coal cooking that has taken over the rest of the nation. And we've lived with that dichotomy in Britain ever since. I mean, if you come to Britain and you try and eat in a hotel, oh, you poor sods, it's, the food's terrible. I mean, the food in British hotels is, I mean, I have to spend a lot of time in British hotels, so I can, I can say it's blinking awful. <laughs> There's very little resemblance to what the rest of us are eating. Um, and that has been the way for several hundred years. <laughs> Steer clear of hotel food if you possibly can. It's terrible. It's usually really bad, low quality copies of French stuff, um, particularly if you get outside London. London's not so bad. It's got other traditions that have come in and helped there, you know, so you get a bit more variety. But oh, God, provincial hotels keep away from them. They're, they're dreadful. And that has been a pattern, as I say, for a long time. You feel, you hear travellers and people talking about it throughout the centuries, that um, if you want to eat real British food as a traditional British food, you have to get away from that sort of commercial thing and go and find the middle and working class food in order to be able to taste cold cooking, which is utterly different. Now, we mentioned that 
it all happens much later in London, uh, uh, in, in the US. Um, and that's certainly true. And it means that parts of the tradition, the cold tradition, don't make it to the US and parts of it do. The toast makes it to the US, but the boiling tradition doesn't really. Um, and when you read um, recipe books from the 18th, 17th, 18th and 19th century that are taken over to America and adapted for American, it's very clear that um, most people are not really understanding quite what's going on with the boiling um, and not doing it very well, not really understanding what it is, not really being able to recreate it properly because they haven't sort of had that. Well, for a start, many of them are doing it on wood rather than doing it on coal, but they're also not, haven't got that sort of body of time and, and uh, body of equipment to do it because the equipment had to be really quite specific and it took a long time to develop. If you were to look at the sort of equipment a coal-fired kitchen had in the 1600s, it's pretty basic. Oh my goodness, is it basic. So the earliest I can find is in a set of maps of London that were um, drawn up for a rents, for, for the purposes of collecting rents, but they're grand plans, um, room by room, and each room done by a chap called Treswell, Roger Treswell, and uh, each room is, is marked out and there's different colours to show if the walls are stone or brick or wattle and daub. Um, each hearth is, is marked and each oven is marked and each well is marked and each uh, fence and wall externally is marked and they're often labelled as to whether it's a kitchen or a chamber or a yard or whatever and sometimes with the name of the person who's paying the rent as well. And in one of those, these are um, 1605, 1605, in one of them, in a cook shop, there is the very first mention of the word range. And you can see against the wall on the back are two little brick pillars. That's it, that's all the map shows. The two little brick pillars are looked to be about four, maybe five feet apart. And they're just little pillars against the wall. Now, what I think that means is that there were iron railings going between those little brick pillars to make a very simple, narrow grate so that you could put coal in and roast. And that that's sort of brings us to one of the form of cooking that's within this coal tradition and this British tradition um, that we haven't touched on yet. Roasting meat was always the, the, the signature dish of Britain. It's what we're always, I mean, the French have always called us the roast beefs the roast beefs, because they, they, it's a joke, that's what we eat, we all we want to eat is roast beef. And certainly during the 18th century, it was the food that people aspired to. It wasn't their everyday food, it was the party food of the people. Roast meat, in particular, roast beef. Now, weirdly, although we think of roasting very much within these eras of the 17th and 18th century in particular, and those are coal cooking eras, it's actually much easier and better to roast on wood. You get the nice smoke flavours, it's very much easier to manage, you can, you know, you, you just organise, you have your brand irons, you put the wood across, you get this nice wall of flame. It's, it's a very straightforward process. Um, but when people moved over to coal, they still wanted it. It was the party food of the era. And so they're desperately trying to find ways of making coal do the same thing the wood will do. A little heap in a grate isn't going to be out much good. What you need is a wall of flame. And so to do that, they create these sort of special grates, these ranges. And that's what I described there with the little wooden, the little uh, brick pillars, and then the, 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 the iron bars going at the front. This is the thing that they came up with in order to roast. That filled it, it's a very narrow, it's a very narrow strip. You fill it with coal, so you've got a long, thin fire, and, you, and it's also quite high, so that you've got it all banked up against the front. And if you're making the fire, that's what you do. You pull it forward all the time. You don't push the fire back, you pull it forward, so that you've got glowing coals resting up against this, the sets of bars in front. And then your meat sits in front of it and rotates in front of this glowing wall of coal. And that's what does your roasting, the fat drips down, you can collect it and so forth. It is something that took a lot of fiddling about to get quite right. And people began to tinker with all sorts of other ways of 
how, how do we make this coal work? So we start thinking about how to enclose pieces of the fire so that we can keep the smoke away from the food, so that it doesn't all have to be boiled, so that we've got options, so that we can do a bit more frying, we could perhaps do a little bit of, um, you know, anything. And with that also then for comes the idea of a separate oven. Think about it. Everywhere else in the world, until that date, ovens had been separate from the main fire. They'd been brick holes, brick or, or stone domes, um, that you put a fire inside and you light the fire and it burns and it makes the actual stones hot. I mean, you can do it with clay as well, some of the earth ones too. When that fire has burned down, you take the fire out and you put your food in the space where the fire used to be. Now that's how all ovens were, right across the world. But it doesn't work with coal. It tastes foul. You've got all this nasty ash, what are you gonna do? So for a long time, people just sort of had their oven, the old wood-fired oven at the side, it was the coal for doing the rest of the cooking, but the wood-fired oven for doing the baking. And then somebody came up with an idea. Now, the earliest ones seem to be the late 18th century, and they basically make a little iron box that you can have a fire underneath of that stays lit. And the little sealed off box above it is therefore kept away from the smoke of the coal, the ash of the coal. It has nothing to do with the coal, only the heat from the coal moves into this little iron box. And the modern oven is born. You can't make it too big though. For a start, you can't make plates of iron too big, otherwise they'd all sag and they bow and they're bent. So there's a sort of fixed limit on how big it can be and it's quite small. But on the other hand, you can keep that fire burning. It's not a matter, the old ovens were huge, you left a big fire, you, you got it hot, you took it all out and you filled this huge space, huge space, with as much food as you could and you'd had a bake and you got all your bread and all your pies all done at once, once a week, marvellous. With these little ovens, you can only do one loaf at a time, or maybe two at the most, or a pie. But at least you could like do one loaf, take it out and put something else in, and then take that out and put something else in. So these early ovens were called perpetual ovens because they allowed you to just keep firing and keep doing it. But again, that changes the nature of cooking. It changes it because it gives a slightly different heat so that different things do well, and it changes it because of batch size. So in the rest of Europe, where they carry on with their wood-fired ovens, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense to do your cake and your patisserie at home. Because, I mean, if you've got this huge grey oven, you know, that you're going to fill, well, that's fine with bread that's going to last a week. But do you really want 45 fruit cakes or, you know, 100 jam tarts? Are you going to get through that many? Have you got the ingredients to be able to afford to fill it up? You're not going to fire it just for one pie. That would be ridiculous, very wasteful. So people don't bother to do that sort of cooking at home themselves, unless it's a huge establishment, you know, palaces, whatever. The middle classes instead went to a professional baker where they would make a batch of 30 custard tarts. And then they could sell the 30 custard tarts to 30 different customers. So right across Europe, a commercial baking tradition takes hold in which people buy, they purchase all their sweet stuff, all their fancy stuff. And they only make the bread at home if they're making any of it home, probably buy the bread as well. But in Britain, with these tiny little iron ovens that sit next to a coal fire, that are part of an equipment within a domestic space, you can make one pie at a time, one tart at a time, one cake at a time. So a new tradition arises of home baking. And again, this is, like the toast, one of those things that does cross the Atlantic and become part of the American tradition too. That the idea of having your own small iron domestic oven gives you that were a chance to experiment and to, to play with sweet things, to play with small batches, to play with domestic cooking, baking. And it's, say, these three things, the two that we share and the two that we don't. And they're all driven by this change from wood over to coal. 
I'm going to stop there because I've talked for far too long. I can talk way more, but I, I thought I have a feeling you might rather just break in and have some questions before you all die of boredom from listening to me. <laughs> no, we, we, that is not true. You're fascinating and you're such a fantastic storyteller. I could listen for hours, honestly. I think we all could. Um, in your book, you talk about um, the fact that England wasn't using wood so much that it also uh, depleted, there was no reason for forests. So there were fewer forests. Um, and what do you think the result of that was? There's absolutely no, I, no doubt about it that the British countryside was transformed by the change over to coal. Because we didn't need to use wood for um, fuel anymore, we didn't need to use peat for fuel anymore, we didn't need to use gorse, heather, ling for fuel anymore, people start looking at those resources with different eyes. Now the wood itself, the change is not quite so enormous because there are so many different things you can do with wood. If you've got a growing population, you still need more houses, you need more furniture, you need more window frames, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot of the wooded areas that had been used for fuel manufacture, uh, fuel growth, found an immediate, you know, reuse for for, for producing wood for other purposes. So they sort of remain. What disappears is all those resources which were a bit more marginal. So trees in hedgerows, trees around ponds, trees in a whole range of sort of less commercial spaces no longer mean as much to people. They're no longer needed in the same way. So people get rid of them. They don't bother to look after them anymore. They cut them down, get rid of them. They're in the way. You know, it stops me doing something else. I don't need it anymore, get rid of it. And that is even more true of those sorts of landscapes that produce other fuels, peat, heather, gorse in particular. So Britain has lost almost, I think it's something like 90% of its heathland and something like 80% of its fenland. Um, and that's entirely because people no longer had a use for it. In the old days, you wanted that sort of fuel. If you didn't have trees, that's the only thing you had. But even in areas that did have trees, you needed it for firing your ovens. So gorse and heather in particular, brilliant oven fuel, better than, better than tree wood, brilliant oven fuel. So wherever there was an area of heath, people actually managed it, coppiced it, looked after it, had rights over it, um, you know, and made money, made their living from it. And then suddenly nobody wants that anymore. They've got these little coal fired iron boxes. So why bother maintaining something that's no longer making a living for you? And it just goes. And what happens is our countryside becomes much more focused on food production. It used to have to do both. It used to have to do food and fuel and you've got a patchwork. Every little community wanted a bit of this and a bit of that, a bit of the other. They needed all of those resources. Now they only need the food. So why have the other types of land use? So we get a sort of blanding out of the British countryside. Um, and what you see today is something that's very food focused. And all those other landscapes, those other habitats are gone. It's a major problem ecologically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, something else uh, that you that I, that I found interesting is when this new uh, coal came into your house and you talked about there were a lot of difficulties in changing over what you would have made or how you made it, was there anybody teaching you this or was it all just sort of trial and error and a lot of asking your neighbors, I suppose? That's exactly it. And, and there, the, the very few comments there are about the change, and they're very few, as I say, this is a problem for working class women. And nobody bothered to be interested in working class women as a general, you know, for most of them were illiterate anyway. You know, who's going to write about it? It was just not something that people felt those who were recording life just weren't interested in those sorts of people and their problems and their difficulties. But there are a few and they are very few comments, stray comments here and there. And one of the ones I particularly liked was a description that happens in the late 18th century from a, a man who's talking about a region that was a bit backward in coal usage. Actually, it, it was quite inland. You couldn't ship the coal up the, up the rivers and it's before the railways took it to everybody. So he's, he, he comes across a pocket of wood burning and he talks about how the servants there wouldn't have a clue, wouldn't have a clue. If you gave them coal, they wouldn't know where to start. And, you know, and those sorts of occasional little insights are really helpful. Um, but there was no teaching, there was no formal anything, and there's certainly no manual handwritten. The first 
sort of places that you get some information on, I believe that are in the US, where because the change happens so late, happens in the 19th century, not the 16th century, yeah. you're getting a lot more things written down. And because it's never so complete a change, you've always got that balance between the town and the country. So you do get in women's magazines of the early 19th century, uh, early 20th century, late 19th century, you get discussions about the differences between country cooking and town cooking, country cleaning and town cleaning within early 20th century housework magazines and articles in the US, which of course you don't in Britain because the change had happened so long ago. Um, one thing also you talk about in your book, I know it's quite a lot actually, but maybe you could just touch on it. And that is uh, the development of soap. Oh yeah, yeah it's a big issue, that. isn't it? Yes. I know, it is a big issue. See. In a pre-coal world, everybody right across the globe basically used the same thing. We all used wood ash because it is an extremely effective um, chemical. You, if within wood ash, now I'm going to get the chemical wrong. It doesn't seem to matter how many times I look this up. I always get the ready name of the chemical wrong. So potassium, I, I'm not going to even try. Potash. Okay. Right. <laughs> So it's ash, you pour water through, uh, you strain it, you know, put it in a cloth or something, pour water through, and you'll see that what comes through is a, a clear but coloured liquid. It's sort of, it, it's sort of slightly yellowy. Um, and it's leached this chemical out of the wood ash. Now this is an alkali. And if you pour it through lots of times, particularly if you do it with hot water many times over, you can make it really quite a strong alkali. Alkali dissolves grease. It also kills bacteria. That is the basic ingredient that everybody all over the globe used for hygiene. You can use it for washing up, you can use it for laundry, you can use it for anything. You can use it in different concentrations. If you want to, you can take that same liquid, boil it up with fat, and that makes soap. That's what soap is. It's this alkali liquid boiled with soap. The two combine, they make soap. So if, for example, you're out in the woods and you fry your sausages um, in, a, in a frying pan, you've got a greasy pan, you want to clean it, all you have to do is take a handful of wood ash out of the fire, drop it in, a splash of water, squish it round in the heat, and you've made your own soap in the pan. Um, and then you pour it away. Um, it's, it's as simple as that. But once you stop burning wood in your home, you stopped having free detergent in your home. Coal ash does not do the same thing. It's useless for cleaning. Absolutely useless. It's just dirt. So, People now have to find, well, well, what do I do? How do I clean anything? How do I wash up? How do I do my laundry? How am I gonna manage hygiene? Now I've got no wood ash, what am I gonna do? Well, the only thing they can do is to go out and purchase commercially made soap. So we get an enormous and early push to expand the soap industry. Initially, the commercial soap industry responds by just importing wood ash from elsewhere. Uh, Denmark in particular, uh, you can read the accounts of boatload after boatload of Dansk ashes um, coming in for the soap industry. And they start like, what, what fat? We're running out of fat. So we're going to need more fat. Now we need all this fat now because we've got to make it into soap. We can't use, you know, what are we going to do? So they start thinking, right, well, that includes, so that bumps up the whaling industry. People start using whale oil, whale blubber. So you get this whole new idea. Gradually as the 16th moves into the 17th and then into the 18th century, people are starting to look around for other forms of alkali. We, we, can't, we haven't got enough wood ash even if we import it from Scandinavia. <laughs> there just isn't enough there. We need something else. So they start looking around and exploring and you get ideas coming in from um, exploration in Africa. They start finding alkalis in deposits in lakes and some of the dried up lakes in Africa that gets shipped in. People start trying to do chemistry experiments to try and make an alternative forms of alkali. So it sparks a whole chemical industry. Meanwhile, back in cleaning, everybody has got used to the idea that soap is the magic ingredient. As I say, it starts in London by 1600. The Londoners are using soap. And they, of course, like every capital dweller the world over, assume that they are superior, better, and more civilized than country people. Um, so they start sneering at their country neighbors for carrying on using the word ash, and we have soap, we're so sophisticated. I mean, this is the modern way, love. This is how to be clean properly, you know? That's a backward. 
And so the whole of Britain basically gets pushed over to soap. And then, of course, we go out to the rest of the world and we say exactly the same to them. We say, oh, look at you, you backward people. You can't possibly be properly clean like that. You've got to use soap, mate. You know, soap is the way to be hygienic. And out they go all over the globe. Every, um, Americans are very, very, very susceptible to this um, and take it on board very quickly, long before they have coal. Americans are swearing by soap when they needn't. They could perfectly well have carried on with the wood ash, but I'm afraid the citizens of the US fell for this just as quickly as the citizens of Britain. Um, and, yes, in we're quite term, and in their own turn went and proselytized it round, you know, and when you read some of the missionary stuff that comes back, you know, some Canadian missionary in, in, um, in China going on about the twin things of, you know, Christ and, and so, you know, it's this great religion and the advertising just makes you cringe, the most colonially bullying, unpleasant, nasty advertising that goes with it. Essentially, we convert the world to soap use, we tell everybody all over the globe, and to this day, most people in the globe believe it, that soap is superior, that the only way to be properly clean is to use detergents. So, I mean, detergent has sort of taken over from soap, but with, it is, it's, it's inherited the entire right. emotional package that's gone with it. Uh, and plus, <laughs> uh, the, the, I mean, people's house just with the coal use had to be dirtier just the soap oh they're much dirtier it's filthy and i think that is one of the very first things that that time when i first had to use coal that was before even before the food that was the first thing that hit me it was it was just extraordinary i was accustomed to managing wood-fired homes i knew how much work was involved i was accustomed to doing it and doing it without modern conveniences you know i was perfectly happy with a tudor way of cleaning um, and you know and then suddenly i've got coal to damage Oh my God, the workload. It was just like a ton of weight just fell on my shoulders. Everything was so much harder. There was so much extra filth on surfaces, on your clothes, the washing up was harder. And then the, and the actual cleaning processes were harder because soap doesn't really work, particularly those early forms of soap. In cold water, you have oh, to have right. hot water. So suddenly you've got to boil all this water and, and, and you know, you can't, no longer can you do your laundry in cold water. Now it's all got to be hot water. Yeah. So again, that ups the amount of workload. It was quite shocking. I mean, I have a suspicion that when we talk about, you know, the rise of women as being in the domestic sphere, this idea in Victorian that, that women should be within, I wonder if it might have been pushed by the practical, that simply the burden of housework had increased so much the women were sort of trapped by that in a home in a way that they hadn't been in the wood burning pre-eras. Huh. Um, someone asked, um, where in the supply chain did coal get broken down into size that it could be easily used in the home? Oh, well, it varies enormously from region to region and from date to date. I mean, um, within Britain, those that early expansion in London, the coal was all coming from Newcastle. So if you look at a map of Britain, you'll see that uh, Newcastle is pretty much nearly Scotland, um, um, but it's on the east coast. Um, and London, of course, is also on the east coast, but it's down the bottom. So that's a couple of hundred miles, um, which you might think was awkward. But of course, it's not because you can put the, the, the coal in Newcastle was right on the coast. Um, it fell out of sort of the sides of the river. Um, and indeed out of cliffs on the seafront. So it could be mined very close. You could sort of dump it straight in a boat. Once it was in a boat, it could go all the way down around, come up the Thames, right into the center of the city. So the actual transport was very, very easy. Other deposits of coal, which might've been, you know, as the crow flies much nearer, were much harder to get because you'd have to go over land or, or different sea journeys that were more difficult. So it was mostly Newcastle coal that came down and that's particularly horrible coal actually. Um, Coal varies, every deposit is different. Yeah, right. um, and the stuff that was coming from Newcastle was particularly sulfurous and sort of stuck together in a nasty, clumpy lump. Um, and London burned that for a very long time. It's really difficult to handle. Later on, as other coal fields developed and transportation changes, we get better. I mean, within Britain, the best coal is in Wales, South Wales, um, particularly the Pembroke. Uh, outcroppings. They're not very big outcroppings in Pembroke, but they are so high quality. Oh, oh, oh. my God, that stuff's good. Um, <laughs> but Welsh coal in particular, even the very best, the, the other stuff going up in the valleys, um, was always high quality coal. And that would come in big, beautiful rock lumps that you would have to bash up. 
to use for domesticate, but it wasn't mostly used domestically. That really high quality stuff that comes in nice big lumps, uh, nice big rock pieces, that was more reserved for um, steam engines later on. Yeah. Um, it, it's a much higher quality, it, it, it's good for that, steam coal. Whereas house coal was usually this lower quality stuff that came from mines where it was already fairly broken anyway. Um, higher sulfur content, not so good. Um, it, it varies enormously. And of course, within the US, your coal deposits are just as varied. And so every town will have had a different way of dealing um, with the sorts of supplies that were coming in. And what about the expense of coal versus wood? I mean, wood at the time you actually could go and maybe get it yourself, probably not if you lived in No, London, you couldn't. No, cold. you couldn't. Yeah. No, you couldn't. It's really important to remember this. Britain is tiny. It's yeah. really small. And every single inch of the land in Britain is owned by somebody. And they have the rights to the things that are on it. And it varies. Now, sometimes the rights aren't all with the land owner. Sometimes they're divided with the tenant. So traditionally, the land owner had the right to every piece of timber. That means the trunks and the main branches. But a tenant had the right to a sort of like the twiggy bits or anything that fell off. But they both need that. They can both make money out of it. So they both guard every single twiggy, branchy bit with that, you know, you can't go out and pick a hedgerow. That is somebody's hedge. Yeah. You can't go out and go into the woods. That is somebody's woods. You would be prosecuted if you just helped yourself. So no, wood was not free. Wood was always owned by somebody. So most people who were, you know, short of fuel were not the people who owned the land and therefore they're having to purchase. That's a really important point to make. Oh, yeah. It's the I same with food. Is. Yeah. yeah, it's the same with food. Was, was coal more expensive though? Coal, you had to buy coal. You had yeah. to buy wood. You know, coal was cheaper than wood. Uh, I see. Hmm. Um, someone asked, well, what kind of coal does Britain have? Is it uh, uh, aranthocyte or bituminous? We have pretty much every type you can think of. We have a lot of coal, or did have before we mined most of it out. Um, the, the, the good stuff, the anthracite, is uh, there's several, a number of deposits. Um, as I say, the best is probably in Wales, but there are quite good anthracite deposits in, in England as well. Um, uh, we, we move right down the, the, the range down to brown coals, which are hardly more than peat. And of course, we've got peat as well. There is a lot of coal in Britain. It varies enormously. Um, in your book, you talk about how coal has also changed the type of cooking utensils that um, we use. Could you touch on yeah. that briefly? Yeah, well, it, again, it's because of the heat. That coal burns differently from wood. So if you, um, it's not only the, the temperature of the heat, but also the shape of the heat. So if you make a, a wood fire, you'll find that the, the flames tend to go into a sort of pyramid shape. You know, if they're uncontained by anything else, then that, that's sort of what they want to do. They go into peaks, long, lazy, tall peaks. Um, you know, breeze moves it around, etc. But that's the basic shape it wants to make. If it hits a surface, it opens and it curls round. If it's a flat surface, it, it sort of just does that. If it's a rounded surface, it curls around it like that. So traditionally, pots were always rounded because that makes sense. You know, if the flame's going all the way around, you're getting so much more efficient heat transfer. Um, so, you know, for centuries, millennia, I mean, if you look at the very first, you know, pottery from the Beaker people way back, you know, 6,000 years ago, they're rounded in order to make use of the full heat. Coal doesn't do that. It doesn't make pyramids. It makes lots of little points, little hot spots. So if you put a rounded pot on, you've only got contact this little bit here. So that's really inefficient. What you want for a, 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 a coal heating pot is something with a very flat base so that you can get all these little pricks of heat. Ideally, you don't even want that. You want a plate of iron and then you put your pot with a flat bottom on the plate of iron. But of course, that takes even more iron. So you've got this sort of development. People need to change the shape of the pots and they need to change the shape of the fireplace. And then there's the different heat. So a wood fire will happily work with a pottery pot. That's, you know, I mean, that's what they all were for centuries. People would have some iron pots later on in time, but mostly they were working with pottery. And the sort of iron 
pot that you had, the metal pots that you had. Um, traditionally, when people did have them, they'd have two sorts. They'd have a beaten pot and a cast pot, and they'd use them for different things. So a beaten pot, which is called a kettle, is for doing water, and it is very thin in profile. So a kettle is for boiling water, and you beat the metal, whether it would be bronze or iron. Um, and a cast pot is much thicker, and that would be for doing things that, 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 that need a slower, slower cook. You know, sort of slow and steady, it spreads the heat, it holds onto it, it evens out the heat. So you'd use that for your pottages and so forth. Coal burns much hotter. So you've got these patterns that were perfectly happy at these wood temperatures, and now you've suddenly doubled the heat going in. The metal responds differently. Those kettles were all burning through. Suddenly they didn't last for ages. They were, you know, they were being destroyed. The, the, and likewise, the, the, so there was a need for a new sort of pot and a need for uh, different metals. Um, and it is, again, really rather interesting to note that the moment in which people like to say that's the Industrial Revolution is often said, not always, but often said to be Abraham Darby inventing a way of making iron with coke. And he did it in order to make cooking pots. That was his full motivation. That's where he made his profit. That's what his business was based on. It just so happened that this new metal <laughs> he invented and the new method of making it, because he made a different sort of cast iron, not just yeah. a cheaper cast iron, but a different sort of cast iron. Um, that pay, it just so happened that whilst he's making his living making pots, when Stevenson and the likes came along and said, I need some railway parts, you know, oh yeah, I can do that, that's easy. That's just like making a pot and in a different shape. Yeah. So <laughs> again, the, the ramifications of this change are just enormous. Cooking pots and cooking, they're not just changing um, uh, you know, food. Right. They're also being there as a sort of spark for other aspects of modernity. And of course, if you think about the coal industry, the change to food happens 1600. Industry don't get really interested in um, coal until 1700, a century later. Right. And if they'd been interested, you know, would they have been interested, would they have been able to be interested if we hadn't had a whole century of developing our coal fields first right. for the domestic market? Hmm. It's a really interesting question, isn't it? Right. Fascinating. Um, I have another question to say, uh, did the uh, coal smoke uh, in cities increase health population, health, health problems in the urban population? Oh yeah, oh definitely. I mean, this is not, this is not my work. Somebody else did yeah. a really fantastic book on the smoke of London. And by his reckoning, by 1600, the levels of air pollution within London were already at the rate that modern Beijing is at. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's been oh. a major problem right from the start. Yeah. Ruth, as I said, we could uh, listen to you for hours and hours. <laughs> um, does anybody, um, but our time is, is relatively up, does anybody else have any questions they'd like to ask uh, themselves? If you would, you can unmute yourself to do that. Well, Miss Ruth, I don't have a question, but I just want to thank you so much for enriching my life. Oh, and, that's so sweet. <laughs> enlightening it. And um, I just, I just adore you. Oh, you lovely, lovely person. Thank you. <laughs> oh. I'm sure if I knew you, I'll adore you back. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I can't wait to tell my mom that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have quite a lot of fans here. So uh, ditto uh, from everybody. Uh, so thank you so much. Any other questions or comments before um, we uh, leave? Just the, just the same for Ruth. Um, <laughs> I don't even know how many times I've rewatched all of the BBC farm shows. Um, <laughs> and so you and Alex and Peter and, you know, Tom for two of them, just so much joy. And especially during the pandemic, when I couldn't do my usual SCA reenacting, being able to sit and knit and put on those shows, particularly the Christmas episodes, is just the best thing. Just keeps me going. <laughs> oh, I, I just wanted to say thank you for your shows. They're wonderful. And thank um, you. it's such a, oh, it's a thrill to meet you. <laughs> um, I, have I have your books. And, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Every time you 
we we see these shows with like Downton Abbey or they were all, all the servants are always cleaning the um the stoves like yeah. what do they use and how long and does yeah it, you have it, to they're really temperamental things and if you don't keep them spotless they they lose efficiency very quickly okay. they get okay. builds up of um uh, colons uh, smuts and things um and they become pretty damn useless pretty damn quick um they're also like they just pump filth out into the room so if you don't keep the filth down at source you soon soon got a nasty sticky coating all over your room so they generated the most enormous amount of work. Um, people used whatever they could. Uh, basically, it's elbow grease. It's about scrubbing all that muck off um, with whatever brushes and um, scrapers you can you can get. And then people would sort of make try and make it look a little nicer by making it shiny black by using blacking. But all blacking is is a mixture basically of soot and fat. Um, you know, <laughs> or graphite. Sometimes people use ground up graphite and a little bit of fat to rub all over it to make it look black and shiny because at least then you've got a sort of even finish, um, which was slightly more appealing than than than, than not. Um, but that's all it is. It, I mean, the work, I cannot overestimate, I cannot overemphasize just how much additional work coal firing your home creates for somebody. It's It's extraordinary. Wow, thank you. Bruce, I have a question. So it seems like the, the the solution for dealing with the coal has changed a lot of industries, mostly in metallurgy and how metal is how metal used to construct different types of pots and different types of stoves to handle different types of cooking. How what what were they done to were there were there efforts to reshape the coal into a way that could be because I've seen, you know, hexagonal shapes. Or I don't remember the round, but like cylinder, but with uh, holes inside. Yes, I mean, there's only amount of uh, sort of briquette things uh, have been tried. Uh, they've mostly been attempts to improve burn efficiency or to um, improve um, economy. Um, so a lot of the sort of shaped briquettes are actually shaped because they're mixed in with something else to pad them out to make it go further. Um, none of it's ever been that successful it doesn't make a huge amount of difference uh you can see experiments going on right through from the 18th century right through to modern usage um basically they're not that great because <laughs> that's what i remember my grandparents using because they just had to walk they didn't have any flat pots everything was done in the walk you want to boil water it's the walk you want to stir fry it's the walk and i remember Putting, I remember my grandparents telling me like, "You do not let it die out. If you die out, we're going to be in trouble. There'll be no hot water or no no heat tomorrow for breakfast." So you have to remember, as it dies out overnight, you have to put on another one of those cylinders or hexagonal shapes. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a real faff to work with. Um, I mean, there is something to be said that well, I, I was very careful to say that London was the very first place in the Western world to go over to coal because um, Beijing did too. Yeah. Um, and uh, a number of other places within uh, China um, were experimenting using coal domestically quite early. Unfortunately, I don't have the expertise or knowledge to really be able to sort of study in depth what, what was going on in China. I'm just, just not skilled enough, <laughs> clever enough. <laughs> Um, and I think there is work to be done there on what influence did coal have upon um, the Chinese cooking in particular. It's because, it, again, you see, it, 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 unlike Britain, the Chinese coal experience is very regional, it's mm. very much associated with particular regions and particular cities. Um, but of course, you know, Chinese cooking is very much <laughs> something that reflects particular regions and particular um, uh, cities. So, you know, I think there is an opportunity there for somebody to do some really quite interesting work on the food research of the, of the link in China between the coal and, and food. Um, but again, it never moved like the whole of China. Did. It, it, the place is too big. <laughs> so you, you, you don't get quite the same cultural transformation. Britain is tiny. Mm. as a lot of people in a very small space. And because we're so small, cultural ideas as, and methods and techniques tend to move around us very quickly. We get very universal coverage quite quickly. Um, when something comes in culturally, we tend to adopt quite solidly. Whereas in, in larger, I mean, I really notice that if I go to the US, what I 
I, if I go to the cities, it feels like modern modern world. And as soon as I go out into the countryside, I'm like, oh, this is like the 1950s. I say, oh, <laughs> we don't have that in Britain because yeah. we're not big enough to have that sort of diversity of, you know, we all tend to move at much the same pace. Mm. Um, and and that, that sort of does give a different cultural um, slant on things and, and impact how, yeah. you know, ideas and food and... Uh, it's different. Yeah, it is very much different. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ruth, before we let you go, are there any projects uh, or what are you working on now? Uh, well, I'm busily trying to persuade somebody to let me write a book on the history of housework, um, but I'm struggling with that. Publishers huh. are very shy of that idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you the best of luck with that. <laughs> Ruth, thank you so much for uh, speaking to us and uh, we really appreciate that. Again, this, this is recorded and uh, we will post it later for people who are not able to be here. But from uh, this side of the pond to your side of the pond, thank you very, very much. Well, um, thank you very much for letting me share. I mean, I just love talking about this stuff and I, it's really kind of you all to bother to listen, I'll be honest. <laughs> we <laughs> love <you>. it, <laughs> we love it. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.